to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. May he who began this amazing work in you bring it through until completion. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit today and always. So be it. Amen. Uh, tradition of, uh, of Jason's predictions, and may I just remind you from a biblical perspective, you know what they did with Old Testament prophets who predicted wrong? They stoned them. You can read it. They, they stoned them. Now, Jason's alive and doing well after seven years of false prophecies, because he's a New Testament prophet. He's a New Testament prophet, and Jesus taught us, let you who are without sin throw the first stone. So uh, none of us is in danger of getting stoned at New Hope Kailua. <laughs> And uh, anyway, it's kind of fun and hope you enjoy the afternoon. This morning we're here for the real kickoff. Whether or not you're excited about a football game, there is a real kickoff this morning and we are kicking off our journey through the book of uh, Philippians and it is a journey of joy. It's a journey in which God is inviting us as a church family and can I just make it personal to you? God is inviting you to walk this path and experience a deeper level of joy in your life. How many of you could probably use even just a tad more of joy, if not a heaping measure more joy in your life? I certainly could. And um, this is a journey to joy because it's actually a journey to Jesus. But what I want us to realize this morning as we engage this journey, as we kick off this path that we're going to walk together on and seek God for a deeper measure of joy in our lives, I want us to realize that, catch this, it is a surprise journey to joy. It is an unexpected journey to joy because the guide under the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, who exemplifies joy, who shows us this roadway of joy, had circumstances in his life that were a disaster. Now, um, all of us understand that if something good happens in our life, that, that we naturally have happiness and joy. If, if we find the love of our life or um, if we... Um, uh, get married, great joy in our life. If we have a child born or a grandchild born, great joy. If we get a promotion, if something good happens in our life, it produces joy. We get that. But that's not what happens with the Apostle Paul. If you look what the circumstances of his life were when he wrote this letter, it was a disaster and not just a one-month disaster. It was a nightmare for four years let me just give you the, the uh, short version of the circumstances in Paul's life that help us to see. It'll lead us to the secret to Paul's joy because it was a surprising joy. It was an unexpected joy. You wouldn't expect joy to flow from Paul's life for this reason. What led to him writing the letter of Philippians? Well, started four years previous. He's going up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord in the temple. He's been going on missions journeys and preaching Christ all over the place, and, and he had there had been enemies had risen against him, didn't like the message of the gospel, uh, Jewish people whose lives were being thrown apart by the message of the, Jesus as Messiah had become enemies of the gospel, had become enemies of Paul. So Paul goes up to Jerusalem and he's taking a gift for the poor. And some of the uh, Jews from uh, Asia Minor, from modern day Turkey, saw Paul in the temple. He had been seen walking with some Jewish some Gentile people outside of the temple, and guess what? They falsely accused him. It all started with a false accusation. They accused him of taking these Gentile men into this part of the temple where only Jews were allowed to go, and upon pain of death. If you took a, a Gentile, or if you were a Gentile, went into that section of the temple, it would cost you your life. It was that serious. So they falsely accused Paul of taking a Gentile into the Jewish courts. A mob scene broke out, and these Jewish... Uh, enemies of Paul wanted to kill him. They were trying to kill him right there in the temple. So he was falsely accused, and the Roman soldiers, actually, the security force of the temple, rescued Paul from the Jewish mob. They rescued him, and um, Paul stopped, and, and, and they, were, they were dragging him out of the temple. Paul stopped, and he said, let me just share my testimony, in essence. And he starts telling the Jewish crowd about how he had come to faith in Jesus as Messiah. 
They're all listening to him tell the story until he gets to the point. Oh, by the way, you can read all of this in, in uh, Acts chapter 16 and following. I'm just giving you the short version. Paul's telling his testimony. He comes to the point where he says that God had called him to take the message of Jesus to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people, and the mob goes nuts. And they start riot again, and they're trying to kill Paul. And the Roman soldiers arrest Paul for his own safety and drag him out of the temple and put him in prison right there in Jerusalem. So he's number one, falsely accused, wrongfully arrested. He didn't do anything wrong, but he's in prison. Well, uh, he's going to go on trial. They're going to blame him for the, the riot in the temple. He's going to go on trial, but they hear about the fact that Paul's enemies are plotting an ambush just as he's going to be taken from prison to the Sanhedrin. They're going to attack and try and kill Paul again. So the Romans get a hold of this, and they, they take Paul under guard to Caesarea from Jerusalem, down on the coast, just to protect him, but to put him in another prison. He languishes in prison in Caesarea for two years. Okay, this is not like a, uh, oh, you had a tough month, Paul. No, it's a four-year hardship, injustice. He's falsely accused. He's wrongfully in prison. He's unjustly in prison. For two years he's there, and then the Jews up in, in Jerusalem say, get Paul back up here to Jerusalem so we can go be put on trial. But word gets out again, they're plotting an ambush, and Paul hears about it, so what does Paul do? He says, I'm going to appeal to my Roman citizenship. He was a Roman citizen. He had the right to go on trial and get a fair trial in Rome. So the authorities there say, okay, Paul, we'll let you go to Rome. He gets on a ship, and you remember he gets shipwrecked on the way there. His ship... I mean, he almost gets killed through a storm, but God is protecting him. God is with him. He finally gets to Rome, and he's in Rome under house arrest when he writes this letter. He's got Roman soldiers and, and the Praetorian Guard, not just the regular Romans. They had to be six foot tall to be a Praetorian Guard. He had the, 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 uh, the, the best Roman guards guarding him in this house. But he'd become financially depleted. For four years, he hadn't been able to work. When you're in a Roman prison... They don't uh, feed you. The government doesn't feed you. You're dependent on others to provide for your food, for any financial needs you have. So he's in Rome, under house arrest, can't work, hasn't been able to work for four years. And other Christians are supporting him so he can just survive. So he's, all of this for four years, he's falsely accused, he's wrongfully imprisoned, he's unjustly treated, he's unjustly imprisoned for years, financially depleted. And in all of those circumstances, you'd say, well, Paul, you have reason to be angry. You have reason to be upset. You haven't been treated fairly. This isn't right. This is unjust. You have reason for bitterness. And Paul is overflowing with joy. Um, just let me read some of the passages when we read through this book. You'll notice them. But this is, this is Paul's letter of joy. It's sometimes called that. He says this, chapter 1 and verse 4. In all my prayers for all of you, he's writing to fellow Christians in Philippi, I always pray with joy. His heart is bubble. He's in house arrest after all of this hardship, all of this trouble, all of this persecution, all of this injustice. And he says, I'm praying for you with joy. He says, I know that I will remain. He's facing trial in Rome. He says to these Christians, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and your joy in the faith. He says, but even if I am being poured out, chapter 2 and verse 17, as a drink offering, his life is being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. His heart is filled with joy. And he says in chapter 3 and 1, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Take your joy in the Lord. Chapter 4 and verse 1, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Do you get it? This is the surprise letter of joy. He had reason in his circumstances for bitterness, for hurt, for injustice, for all of these negative emotions, and yet Paul is experiencing abundance of joy. He is a worthy guide, if you will, under the Holy Spirit to point us, whatever circumstances we're in. And you may be in circumstances of difficulty, of challenge, of, of, of uh, hurt, even of injustice, and yet... Or you may be in circumstances of blessing and goodness. And, and, uh, and yet in any circumstance, Paul says, this is the pathway to joy. What was the secret? What was Paul's secret to this life of joy? 
Well, it's right there in the first verse, and if you haven't pulled out your notes yet, I want to point it out because this is crucial. In the very first chapter, very first verse of the book of Philippians, we discover not only Paul's secret to joy, but your secret to joy. And it's simply this. The secret to joy, it's to surrender your life to Christ Jesus. To voluntarily submit, that's what surrender means. Voluntarily submit to Jesus as your king. You know, he says something, and it's right there in verse 1, something fascinating. He says, he identifies the source of his joy, the secret of his joy, as he introduces himself to these Christians he's writing to at New Hope Kailua, oh, at Philippi as well. Paul and Timothy, Timothy's with him, and look at how he identifies himself. Look carefully, you can underline it. Servants of Christ Jesus. We're going to come back to that. Servant, that's how he identifies himself. I am a voluntary bow the knee servant of Jesus, of King Jesus. He says this, to all God's holy people, those set apart in Christ Jesus, again, Christ Jesus, at Philippi, at New Hope Kailua, together with all the overseers and deacons, the leaders that had risen up in the church, and he wishes them blessing, grace and peace to you from God the Father, God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the key. Did you notice he says Christ Jesus? Now, in case you might think, you know, very often we misunderstand Jesus' names and we hear the name Jesus Christ. And we think of our culture. Most of us have two names, middle name, but given name, Rick, family name, Stinton. We all have two names. And we think of Jesus, fam given name, family name, Christ. But that's the wrong understanding. Jesus had a personal given name, Jesus, but Christ is his title. It's his office. Christ is Christos in the Greek translation of the Old Testament word Mashiach, the anointed one. Who's the anointed one? God's king. God's king over his people. It is King Jesus. And he puts that name first twice. He says, servants of King Jesus. I'm identifying myself as having bowed the knee to the king of the universe and the king of my life, and his name is Jesus. That's the secret of his joy because what he had come to do was place his faith in and follow the mother load of joy, King Jesus himself. And when you understand that Jesus is the source of joy, he's the fullness of joy, that when you seek Jesus, whatever your circumstances, joy will flow into your life. And let me give you this image because it's a real one. If your heart, if your life is a castle, a castle, um, Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of your heart when the king is in residence. <laughs> when King Jesus reigns over your heart, joy is the flag that flies over your castle. Let me give you another image. This one actually Jesus gives us, John chapter 15, to help understand the relationship. It's an agricultural relationship. It's an organic relationship. Jesus says, I'm the vine. You guys are the branches. There's no life in the branches. If the branch is away from the vine, it just dies and withers and it's useless. But when the branches are connected to the vine, the vine is the source of life. The vine is the life giver. And the life flows from the vine into the branches and produces fruitfulness. What kind of fruitfulness? Love, joy, peace, strength, although strength isn't listed as a fruit of the Spirit. Paul says... When I bow the knee to King Jesus, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All of these spiritual fruitfulnesses flow into our lives when we're connected to Jesus. He's the life giver. He's the king. Paul had discovered that in his own life. And whatever his circumstances were, joy flowed into his life. And his circumstances were a disaster. It was a nightmare. It was four years of hardship, of trouble, of persecution, of, of almost having his life taken, being beaten up or being killed in a storm, but in all things, and he comes to Rome and he writes this letter to New Hope Kailu and he says, go on this journey of joy because it's about a journey to Jesus and he's the source of joy. He's the fullness of joy. And when you set your knee under the kingship of Jesus, and by the way, why would any of us want to make Jesus king of our lives? Why would we want to surrender our lives, submit our lives, give up our rights, if you will, to Jesus being king over our lives? Most of us want to be king over our own lives. 
So why would any of us say, Jesus, would you be king over every area of my life? Over my marriage, over my children, over my business, over my family, over my relationships, over my health, over everything. Jesus, would you just be king? Why would anybody want to do that? Here's a simple reason. The king reigns in blessing. Where Jesus reigns, he reigns with love, he reigns with peace, he reigns with strength, he reigns with joy, he reigns with all of these benefits in our lives. And so it's the wise person who says, yeah, I'm going to submit my natural tendency to be king over my own life. I'm going to surrender that and let Jesus rule. I'm going to let him be king. I'm going to allow him to be King Jesus, Christ Jesus, Messiah King Jesus over my life. Paul had gotten that, and he shows us the path, and his life is filled with joy. So the starting point for you and me this morning, and many of us have made that decision, many of us need to maybe rein our lives back onto that road, is simply to bow the knee and say, Jesus, I receive you as my Savior King, because <laughs> he's both. When you trust him for what he did on the cross for your sins, to forgive your sins and rise from the dead. When you trust him, you trust him as your savior, the one who forgives your sins, gives you the gift of eternal life. But he is one person. He is your savior and he is your king. He is the risen king of the universe. And you submit your life to him. And it's a journey that we're all in process on. But when you do that, joy is produced in your life. That's the secret. Simply bowing the knee to the kingship of Jesus, surrendering your life to him. And Paul shows us that and he exemplifies it to us. When you take that step, joy will flow into your life and into my life in a multitude of ways. The key, the secret, is the kingship of Jesus. But in these introductory verses, we see a couple of ways that when you set Jesus as your king, how Jesus' joy will flow into your life. You will be lifted to joy in a couple of ways. And again, in your notes, as you follow along with me, You'll be lifted to joy by, by participating in Christ's mission, by being a part of a team that is carrying out Christ's mission. Why? Because it's good news. It's good news. Let me just unpack it for you there. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you believers at New Hope Kailua. I thank my God in all my prayers for all of you. Catch this, underline. I always pray with joy. <laughs> There's joy in the partnership of the mission. He says this, because of your partnership in the gospel. The gospel is just the good news, the good news about Jesus, the mission Jesus has given us. When Jesus rose from the dead, he gave us a mission, and he said, go and make other followers of Jesus across the planet of every nation. Win them to faith in Christ. Tell them about Jesus. Help them grow to obey everything that Jesus has taught us. And, and that's the mission, and it's a mission of good news, that the God of the universe loves you so much that Jesus came into the world to give his life to deep, deal with your deepest spiritual needs, forgiveness of my sins, gift of eternal life, a restored relationship. That's great news. That's great news. And the whole mission is good news. And so it's called the gospel. And there will be joy when you partner in that mission. That's what he says. I pray with joy because of your partnership in this good news mission from the very first day until now. Being confident of this. This is wonderful. That he who began a good work in you, when you first heard about Jesus and you trusted him as your savior and you started on the road, he will, uh, began a good work in you, he will carry it out to completion. He's building in you a work of art. He's building in you a masterpiece. And uh, he's going to continue that work. It doesn't end when you become a Christian. It actually starts God's good work in you and he's going to complete it. Until the day of Christ Jesus, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, this mission that we have a partnership in, since I have you in my heart. I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, doing the work of the mission, all of you share in God's grace with me. And we'll see what he's talking about in a minute. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I see in these verses this mission, this partnership that Paul shared with these believers. It's the same mission, it's the same partnership that we have here at New Hope Kailua. And there's, there's four elements I can see in these verses where joy flows into our life. When we participate in the mission, the family, under the kingship of Jesus. Here's the first one. The joy of winning people to Christ. 
From the very first start, there's joy when you see people coming to faith in Christ. For Paul, how did it start? You can read about it in, in Acts chapter 16. It started with a dream. He was traveling around, preaching Christ, planting churches in, in um, Asia Minor, in modern-day Turkey. And he had a dream. And a God-given dream, a man from Greece, from Macedonia, said, come and help us. So he changed his plans, and he, he went over to a new continent, the continent of Europe. And in Philippi, this is the church in Philippi, there weren't even enough Jewish people to have a synagogue. He would usually go into a synagogue and tell people about Jesus, and then from there go on to the Gentiles. There wasn't even a synagogue, so he went down to the river. And there were a few Jewish people gathered there, some god fears, and he started telling them about Jesus. And a woman named Lydia came to faith in Christ. And Paul says, now that you've understood who Jesus is in your life, I'm going to baptize you and your family, because the family came to faith in Christ. Those were the first believers in Jesus in the continent of Europe. Started with a dream, and Paul knew the joy of winning people to Christ in that first city in Europe. And then you know what happened. He, there was a, uh, he was preaching Christ, and there was a, a demon-possessed girl who had the capacity to predict the future, and Paul, and, and people were making money off her. She was a business with her predictive uh, capacities, and Paul cast the demon out of her and got himself in big trouble with, with the business owners because they just lost their source of income. So they're beating up Paul, and they're throwing him in prison in Philippi, and then you remember what happens. An angel comes and breaks him out of prison, breaks him and Silas out of prison. The Philippian jailer, whose job was to guard those prisoners, on pain of death, if the prisoners got out, he would be killed. He's about to kill himself because, because of the miracle and the earthquake and the prison being broken open. Paul says, no, don't kill yourself. Let me tell you about Jesus. And he tells this Philippian jailer about Jesus, and the jailer comes to faith in Christ, and Paul baptizes his family. I mean, it's amazing. This was Paul's experience, and he could look back and say, the one who began a good work in you, Lydia, Philippian jailer, your family, he's going to complete it. And there's joy in that. Well, I think you and I can identify with that. Certainly I can here at New Hope Kailua. I could, I could literally spend all morning, and I won't because I know it's Super Bowl Sunday, and it's wrong for a preacher to go overtime. <laughs> it's a sin. So, uh, but... I could tell you all morning stories of, of, that bring joy and, and you would know the people, many of us would know the people and the stories of people who've come to faith in Christ and it's a joy to see people one to faith in Christ. I think of one couple. They're now uh, rerouted on the mainland but when they came to our church family, the husband actually called me up and, and he said, um, I need help, I need help from God. Um, my marriage is in deep trouble. My family's about to split apart and, and we need God. I said, well, please come. We'll do everything we can to, to, to help. And they came he put his faith in Christ. Uh, his wife put his faith in Christ. They had three teenage kids. They all got involved in youth group. They put their faith in Christ. They started serving as a family. We baptized the whole family down at Kailua Beach. It was awesome. There was great joy for all of us to see a marriage healed, to see a family transformed, to see people. Uh, and I got to tell you one more. I could tell you one of my favorite. Martha and I were talking about this this last week. One of my favorite uh, faith in Christ stories from New Hope Kailua Lady started attending our church, heard the good news about Jesus, uh, and was enveloped by God's people, uh, came to faith in Christ, and she wanted to be baptized. So we, we said, we'd love to baptize you. And to me, baptisms are such a highlight because they're just a physical, tangible testimony of how people put their faith in Christ and come out of an old life under the water to a new life trusting Jesus. And it's just a... Well, what happened with this lady? She said, well, I've got a problem. I want to be baptized. But she told me, I have a... Um, electronic uh, band on my ankle. She'd gotten in trouble with the law and uh, she had this electronic band on her ankle to monitor her and, uh, and baptizing her in water was going to mess that up. So we said, no problem. You've got a new life in Jesus. Whatever's happened in your past, um, we'll just put a bag around it. So she came down to the baptism, but she forgot to bring a bag and none of us had <laughs> thought to bring a garbage bag. So it was like, well, she wants to be baptized, but we don't have a bag. So you know what I did? Fortunately, this was a tiny little lady. I don't think she weighed 100 pounds. So I said, let's just do this. I'll just take you in my arms, and I'll dunk you this way, and I'll keep from, from your knee up out of the water so that we don't get you in trouble with the law. And that's what we did. And uh, fortunately, I didn't stumble. But you know what? That was, that was a little special bat, but it was just a life transformed by what? The good news of Jesus, who reaches out to everybody, anyone who would put their faith in, 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 in the good news of forgiveness of sins because what Christ has done and a new life following him. It's joy. It's joy that we all share in. 
The joy of seeing people put their faith in Christ. The joy of spiritual growth, because it doesn't end there. And Paul says, he began a good work in you, but you're not done yet. <laughs> He's building a piece of artwork in your life. The finished product is going to look like Jesus, fully, on the day of Christ Jesus. But he's at work in all of our lives to transform us into the image of his son. Spiritual growth, if you want to call it that. And that brings great joy. And I could tell many more stories, but I know it's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> but I think of one, one family, and, and if I, I won't name them because I wouldn't want them to be embarrassed. But when this family came to our church a few years ago, I think they would have called themselves nominal Christians. They'd attended church. They'd been to church a little bit. I think they had faith in Jesus, but Jesus was not reigning as king over their lives in a very powerful way. But as they came, and uh, yeah, to be honest, I think the wife wanted to come more than the husband, but the husband was willing to come along. But guess what happened? Both of them started to grow. Both of them learned more about who God is, who Christ is over their lives. Both of them surrendered their life more and more to Jesus and his ways in their life. They got involved in ministry. Both of them today are leaders in our church, leaders of ministry in our church. They weren't when they came. And both of them have hosted small groups and been a blessing to others and, and recently opened their home in a real caring way to, to other people. And you know what? There's spiritual growth. There's development. And there is in all of our lives. None of us have reached where Jesus wants us to be totally yet. And there's joy in that. The joy of winning people to Christ. The joy of growing spiritually to be like Jesus. And thirdly, there's the joy of financial partnership. Did you see in that? He says, all of you share in God's grace with me. What's he talking about? He's not talking here about being saved by grace, although it certainly involved that. But later on in the book, he's going to talk about their financial gifts. Philippi, the, the, the letter to the Philippians is in part... A thank you note for the financial assistance they sent to Paul. Because remember, he was wiped out financially. He was depleted financially. He was dependent on other friends and Christians to support him financially. And they had sent funds for him, and he was grateful. And he said, I've learned to be content in all things. I've had very little, nothing. I've been financially depleted. I've had plenty. When I've had the opportunity to work, I've worked and made tents. And, and, but in all of this, I, we share together in God's grace. And he's grateful for the financial partnership that he had with these fellow Christians. And you know what? There's great joy in our financial partnership. That's part of the mission that God calls us. So that when, when we give and when you give your gifts to God, there's great joy because some of those gifts come to help some men on a Monday night recovery group get free of substance abuse because that's a ministry our church supports. And there are young girls who are released from trafficking and, and sex um, uh, oppression on the streets of Honolulu and maybe even in Kailua, right here in our state, because we support a ministry that helps get girls freed from that entrapment. And there are, there's um, uh, joy when part of the gifts of our church family go to help homeless people down in Waimanalo and, and on the East Coast. And there's joy in helping people in need. And it's not just in our state. There's joy in Kenya because our church generously built a, a school and a church there so that these kids that are out in the sticks can be released from poverty because there is no hope for them without an education. And every month our church supports a couple of teachers who not only educate them so that they have a future ahead of them, but they tell them about Jesus. They're Christian teachers. And um, they're establishing the kingdom. Of, and there's great joy in what's going on in, in Kenya. And all because of people like us who are sharing financially and giving to God, but there's joy all over the planet, literally in our own state, in Kenya, in, in Israel, because Yamit is there and, and her team, and we help support her, and she takes the, the love and the good news of Messiah Jesus to Holocaust survivors, these very poor elderly people who their version of Christianity was Hitler. That was what they understand the Christian faith was. And Yamit and her team says, no, let us tell you about the real Jesus and show you the real Jesus. And some of those folks have been one to Christ and, and other people. And you know what? There's great joy when, when this is happening. All over. And yes, there's Brooke in China, whom we help support. And she's an amazing woman who networks with these churches and shares Jesus with everyone she runs across and sends us reports of people who are trusting Christ and what's going on in the church there and how she's equipping leaders. And guess what? There's a joy in this partnership that we all share in because all of us are part of that financial partnership that's part of God's family partnership. So joy in winning people to Christ, joy in spiritual growth, 
joy in this financial partnership that's changing people's lives, and fourth, fourthly, the joy of family bonds. Don't miss this one. This one is huge. Did you capture Paul's heart? He doesn't write to these Philippians and say, I'm so glad I'm in a club with you guys. I'm so glad that we share in an organization. Now, the, the church is an, an organism and an organization, but much more than that, it's a family. It's a family. It's an ohana. Look at what he says. I have you in my heart. My relationship with you is a, is a heartfelt one. How I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. There's deep bonds of relationship. And many of us know what this means. Many of us, and, and we have great blood flam families, uh, physical families. Martha and I, both of our families are on the mainland, and we love them and, 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 and so on. But they're a long ways away. But in New Hope Kailua, we have bonds of affection and a depth of relationship with people because we're all bowing the knee to King Jesus, and we're all in part of his family. And it's a wonderful thing, and this may be new for you in, in your road to, to realize that the family is much, the church is much more than an organization, and it certainly isn't a club. It's a group of people who just bow their knee to Jesus and love him and love each other. And I don't mind telling you, I, I guess I'm a proud pastor in the right kind of way, but I, I love it, and it happens, it happens regularly. Friends will come from the mainland, or, or people will visit as friends of the congregation, and they'll come and they'll say, Rick, your church is such a loving group of people. And I said, it really is. It really is. There's deep bonds of affection and care and love. Can we grow? Absolutely. But um, God has built strong bonds of affection. And that, by the way, that's what a church should be. A church is a place to belong, not just to attend. It's a place to know and know people and to be known. It's a relational place out of relationship with Jesus and relationship with each other. And Paul reflects that. And there's great joy in that. There's great joy in those relationships in the family of God. So, set King Jesus on the throne of your heart and the banner that will fly over your life is joy and he will bring you into a mission and, and flood joy into your life with all the aspects of this mission. But there's a third thing in these verses. Look at verse 9. You'll be lifted to joy by experiencing Christ's love experiencing Christ's love in a growing way, in an increasing way. Had the folks at Philippi known something of Jesus' love? Yes, but look at Paul's prayer. And this is my prayer for you, New Hope Kailua. This is my prayer for you, Rick Stinton. You can put your name in there. This is my prayer for you, that your love may abound, may increase, may overflow more and more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight. It starts with perceiving, understanding, receiving, comprehending Christ's love for you, and then that will change your life. Because look what happens. That you'll have more knowledge and depth of insight into, in, in love so that you may be able to, do, to discern what is best. Maturity. You will be able to discern what is best, not just what is good, but what is best. That's part of maturity. And may be pure on the inside, an internal righteousness. That's part of growth to maturity. And blameless, that's looking at it from the outside. Other people will look at your life and they'll say, well, they're not perfect, I know that, but they're an example. They're a model. They're blameless. They're above reproach. Um, all of these indications of this growing experience of Christ's love in our lives. Pure, blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through our King, Jesus Christ, a God-glorifying life to the glory and praise of God. What's he saying? He says, my prayer for you, Rick, my prayer for you, New Hope Kailua, joy will flow in your life even more so. My prayer is your love would continue to abound. This is how Paul strategically prays for Christians. This is how we should pray for each other thought of the uh, book of Ephesians where he says virtually the same thing to another church writing from prison in Rome and he says that you might know the full dimensions of Christ's love, its height, its width, its depth. Let me just apply that to your life and to my life, how, how the love of Jesus can abound in our lives, can overflow, can increase. What's the height? And, and Paul will instruct us. What's the height of Christ's love? Well, Heaven's king himself, Philippians chapter 2, he says, Jesus, who is fully equal with God, looked down from heaven and he said, what a mess these people's lives are in of sin. Sucks to be them. 
No, he didn't. He looked down on the need of people's lives. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enter the world. I'm going to enter humanity. I'm going to take a body on myself. And so even though he's fully God with God, this is the height of his love, fully God, he takes the form of a man. And not just any man, not a nobleman, not an earthly king, not, not an aristocrat. He takes the form of a servant. He comes to care for the needs of others. And not only a servant, but a servant who's obedient to the Father and not just any obedience, full obedience, even to the point of death. And not just any death. The death on the cross. Agony for the forgiveness of sins for the world. Jesus loves you with that kind of love, heaven's love, from the highest point, reaching down to the cross. That's the height of Christ's love, if you will, and it's personal for you because he would have come if you were the only one who needed him. The width of Christ's love, well, I think of it this way. Width being sort of a timeline from eternity past. He set his heart on love before you were even born. When he saw you in your sins, he didn't wait for any repentance from you, he gave the life of his son ahead of time, knowing your sins. The past is covered by the love of Christ. Your present, whatever circumstance, is covered by the future. Your future is covered by the love of Christ. When he returns, you'll experience the fullness of his love. The whole thing, past, present, future, the width of his love. From heaven to earth, your past, your present, your future. The depth of his love whatever pit you might find yourself in in life. Paul found himself in a lot of pits, but nothing could separate him from the love of Christ and nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. A health pit, a financial pit, a relational pit, whatever kind of pit you go through in life, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. It's that fullness. And he says, when you get this kind of love, you realize that Jesus reigns with blessing, with hope, with love, with peace, and yes, with joy. And that's my prayer for you, that you will understand a fuller measure of his love, and that love will change your life to a God-glorifying life. And that's his prayer for us, and that comes with great joy. As we conclude our service this morning, we're going to celebrate the one ongoing uh, event that Jesus said for the church to do, communion, the Lord's Supper, where Jesus himself said, keep coming back regularly to the source, Jesus, his love. And let me again just explain that the bread and the cup speak of his sacrifice when he said, this is my body, this is my blood. And it looked at the, the loving sacrifice that he came to earth to give for your sake and for my sake. And when you realize that he allowed his body to be broken and he allowed his blood to be shed and out of a heart of love, and Paul knew this. He said, he gave himself for me. And he gave himself for you. And when we're growing in that sense of love, our lives will be increasingly transformed to a God-glorifying life and joy will flood to our lives. So I'm going to uh, invite you in a moment. I'll come down. If you would uh, come forward, we'd just love to serve you communion. Take the elements personally and just take them back to your chair. And uh, the worship team will lead us in a song. In a moment, I'll come back. We'll pray. We'll take the elements together. And then we'll pray together to conclude our service.
king of love, the king who reigns with forgiveness, with strength, with peace, and yes, with joy. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the love that moved you from heaven to the lowest pain up point of earth and even to the point of death. But we praise you that you love us with a love that is stronger than death, that you've given us a hope and a future and that your love flows to us every day. And through your Holy Spirit, we can count on your strength and your joy and your peace and your presence. So we take these emblems gratefully, thankful, Lord, that you're a king, but a king who is everything to us for the realization that with you we have everything, but without you we have nothing. We gratefully take these emblems of your love, your body broken, your blood shed. In Jesus' name, amen. May the joy of the Lord be our strength. God's people said, amen. amen. Have a blessed week.